So early stage testicular cancer. I don't have any disclosures uh, that are pertinent to this talk. And, and, and uh, the professional practice gap is really just, there's a lot of uh, treatment options available for early stage testicular cancer. And so kind of negotiating that landscape is uh, something that providers may be interested in learning more about. Uh, and then, so what we'll do is we'll take a look at the AUA guidelines for early stage testicular cancer, look at patients who may benefit from one treatment or another following orchiectomy, and then also look at surveillance after treatment. And so when we look at early stage testicular cancer, uh, we really break down stage one testes cancer into three different groups, the stage 1A, stage 1B, and stage 1S. And so the difference maker in that is really just the uh, pathology in the testicular tumor, and, and then the presence or absence of serum tumor markers. Uh, so that's quite unique for testicular cancer to have serum tumor markers as part of the staging uh, workup. And so when you look at the pathologic staging of testicular tumors, T1 tumors are those localized to the testicle with no lymphovascular invasion. Uh, T2 has lymphovascular invasion. T3 involves the spermatic cord, and T4 uh, involves the uh, scrotum. Looking at how that breaks down in stage 1 testes tumor, stage 1A uh, really have a low risk of relapse, particularly the non-seminomous germ cell tumors, about 15%, and uh, regardless of treatment, about 99% are cured. Stage 1B, with that lymphovascular invasion, raises the risk of relapse to about 50%, again, with about 99% cure. Now, the stage 1S, those with elevated serum tumor markers, if you observe them or even perform retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, almost all of them will recur. And so we'll, later we'll look at where uh, chemotherapy is the standard treatment for those patients. But even with them, we expect to cure them with treatment. So um, there are many urologists here who have taken care of patients with testicular cancer, and certainly uh, we all kind of understand the workup and the initial treatment. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, the AUA guidelines have, have come out with a uh, strategy for managing early stage testicular cancer, and I think principally where this is helpful is those uh, clinically uncertain areas trying to provide uh, guidelines for us so that we can uh, be sure that we have a uniform uh, care of these patients, and then also if there's any question, it gives us a little bit of guidance. So I'm just going to go through some highlights from the AUA guidelines as uh, options for us in our treatment of patients. When you're working up a patient, the guidelines recommend obtaining serum tumor markers. This is something that doesn't always happen, but there is a, a clear rationale for this. So in a patient who, for instance, has an elevated AFP, but their testicular primary shows seminoma only, now, this is a patient that we would know as some element of non-seminominous tumor based on their elevated AFP, and so we would treat them as such. So that's the really your only opportunity because their serum tumor markers may normalize uh, after the orchiectomy. Certainly gives us that opportunity to understand uh, the, the markers and what they look like before treatment. Uh, I also like to get a testosterone before treatment just to kind of understand their gonadal state before we start operating. And, um, and then uh, sperm banking would be another thing that we could offer to patients. If patients have normal serum, to, uh, serum t uh, tumor markers but have intermediate findings on exam or have a suspicious finding on ultrasound but it's not clearly a tumor, uh, we can repeat the imaging and the workup in six to eight weeks. And so this is clinically something that we run into with a lot of patients. Uh, having the guidelines as a frame of reference, I think, helps us clinically, also could help us uh, in the realm of, of malpractice as well. So we have something to reflect upon the typical workup of a patient with an indeterminate lesion in the testes. Um, any patient with a suspicious uh, uh, mass uh, should, is recommended to undergo a radical orchiectomy, an inguinal orchiectomy, and transcrotal orchiectomy is discouraged, and so that's clear in the guidelines. Uh, some patients are offered testes sparing surgery. It's really rare that that's uh, something that I recommend to a patient, and, and I think there's, it's rare to have a patient who may benefit from that. But uh, if they have a, a normal ipsilateral uh, 
uh, test is, and, and a normal contralateral test is, it, when you're um, evaluating these patients, you should really be cautious about testicular sparing, and that's kind of outlined in the guidelines. Uh, certainly, if a patient has uh, testicular sparing uh, surgery, you would want to sample the remaining uh, uh, testicular tumor or I'm, I'm sorry, the remaining testicular tissue to ensure they don't have germ cell neoplasia in situ uh, because of the risk of uh, disease later and whether or not they would want to undergo a formal orchiectomy or radiation therapy. And so um, I think that's just something where the guidelines really address the, the risks and the follow-up after testis sparing surgery. Um, for those patients who, after orchiectomy, have equivocal levels of serum tumor markers, or let's say they were 100, of a, their AFP was 100 before surgery, it's 25 post-op, uh, the guidelines recommend that you continue to monitor them to see if they uh, normalize. So before you proceed with chemotherapy, the guidelines provide a structure for uh, potentially uh, monitoring the normalization of serum tumor markers. And this, this is something where uh, many times we'll see a patient who uh, they have a marked decline in their serum tumor markers, and, um, but they're still abnormal, and, and then they're recommended for chemotherapy, and then you recheck them, and they've normalized, and, and that's a patient who may be able to avoid chemotherapy. Uh, it is important to reflect upon that, that stage 1S patients have uh, systemic disease and that they need to receive chemotherapy. So if a patient post-orchiectomy has elevations in AFP or HCG, that would, recommend, that would represent a patient who should be referred for uh, chemotherapy. As far as the workup for patients with uh, stage one testes tumor, uh, before treatment, a PET scan is not recommended. There are certain instances, for instance, seminoma patients who've been treated with chemotherapy where PET may be helpful, uh, but in the routine workup, PET imaging is not recommended. Um, let's see, I may have gone backwards. So for patients who have seminoma, uh, if they have stage one seminoma, uh, surveillance is generally the recommended follow-up for them. Uh, now, patients who may have some scattered uh, retroperitoneal lymph nodes, uh, you could consider whether or not they would need additional treatment. It, really looking at stage 2A, meaning a patient who has lymph nodes that are less than two centimeters, uh, the NCCN guidelines would be either radiation or chemotherapy. I think Mostly patients in the U.S. are provided chemotherapy. We're, I, it's been a while since I've seen a patient who's had, uh, who's had retroperitoneal radiation therapy. Uh, this is a tricky space because a patient who has a lymph node less than one centimeter is usually not called, so it's really just between one centimeter and two centimeters. Um, if it's larger than two centimeters, it's stage 2B, and then the NCCN guidelines recommend chemotherapy as a preferential treatment for those patients. In, in seminoma, there's been some recent news about retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Uh, that a lot of that has been directed by Sia Dineshman at USC. He came out with a multi-site trial. We had that trial here. Uh, I was the PI on that trial, and we had a patient who underwent in a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Interestingly, in the trial, uh, they were recommended to undergo a preoperative PET, uh, and and what they're showing is is that. PET imaging before retroperitoneal lymph node dissection and seminoma may help us guide who would be surgical candidates. Now, in this guideline, uh, RPL and D for seminoma is not recommended, so we'll need definitive studies to, to kind of put that forward, but there's the potential that patients may get that in the future. Um, for non-seminomous germ cell tumor patients, uh, there are several different guidelines that are available. One specifically that I thought was interesting is if they have a teratoma in the testis in the primary and that teratoma has a, has a has somatic transformation, then a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection would be recommended regardless of their stage. So uh, basically saying that the potential for spread from a somatic transformation is so great that a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection would be recommended. And then here's kind of a breakdown of the NCCN guidelines for uh, non seminomous tumors. Stage 1A, again, without lymphovascular invasion, their risk of recurrence is very low. Surveillance is probably going to be the optimal treatment. Nerve sparing RPL and D is another option, and then chemotherapy as well. If they do have lymphovascular invasion, 
uh, stage 1B, then a primary retroperitoneal lymph node dissection would be an option. Chemotherapy as well or surveillance. You would have to recognize these groups, the group of men have about a 50% chance of recurrence. And then again, stage 1S would be chemotherapy. Um, there are a select group of patients who may have a non seminal stem cell tumor with retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, maybe an isolated node that is suspicious, uh, who may elect to undergo retroperitoneal lymph node dissection to avoid chemotherapy. And so that's, that's uh, described in the guidelines. Again, that would be a discussion with the patient. Um, as far as guidelines for undergoing a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection and how we would do that, I think there's a lot of uh, suggestion towards a bilateral template in the guidelines, but there is uh, a delineation of using uh, reduced templates, so uh, either a right or left templated dissection, and also uh, using minimally invasive approach like a robotic retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. It, uh, specifically, they make a point of dissecting the lumbar vessels, and I think uh, here we have uh, some pictures of retroperitoneal lymph node dissections. Really, I think what they're trying to key in on is getting that tissue under the great vessels, ensuring you get a complete resection. So this is actually a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection that Dr. Patel did here robotically. And you can see he carried that dissection all the way under. This is his nerve sparing that he has laid out. And then this would be an open retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. So these are those vessels that are recommended to be ligated to ensure that you can get uh, under the great vessels. And then, uh, so surveillance, there's many different surveillance strategies, but the guidelines tried to help us uh, as far as our imaging frequency. Um, let me see if I can move here. The NCCN guidelines are probably one of the best ways to, gra uh, to create a graphic for what that would look like. So. Um, if a patient is a 1A, then you would re-image them every four to six months in the first year and every six to 12 months in the second year. For 1B, because of their higher risk for recurrence, you're going to image them more frequently, expecting that nearly half of those patients will have uh, some recurrence over time. And then finally, in survivorship, uh, there's recommendations towards uh, follow-up care for these patients, particularly if they are treated with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And I think that that's the guidelines understanding that these men are young, generally, when they get their treatment, and that these uh, additional treatments like radiation and chemotherapy carry a risk for both cardiovascular disease and second primary malignancies. And so what we see is that patients who have undergone uh, treatment for testicular cancer, this risk is, is impressive. So. Uh, for second, secondary malignancies compared to surgery, radiation carries a two and a half times increase and chemotherapy a 2.1 time increase. And uh, if you look at second primary malignancies and cardiovascular disease uh, together, either one, radiation 1.8 times, chemotherapy 1.9 times, literally smoking would only uh, create a risk of 1.7 times. So the treatments that we give these very young men with 30 to 40 year life expectancies would be the equivalency uh, risk of smoking or, or worse. And so um, that's really kind of uh, removed the enthusiasm for radiation therapy and certainly made us concerned more about the effects of chemotherapy as well. We know that cisplatin-based chemotherapy is what cures men with testicular cancer. We also know that the, the cisplatin lingers for a, a very long period of time up to a thousand times the uh, level that we would expect as normal, and that can be detected for up to two decades. So uh, that's very concerning to us. The other thing, these second, secondary malignancies, the survivals are very brief. So in this study, the median survival was only one and a half years, and, and that's frightening as well. Uh, in addition, the effects of chemotherapy can reduce quality of life, and so this study was a large study looking at patients who had undergone cisplatin-based chemotherapy for testicular cancer. What's uh, interesting, this is the uh, comorbidities uh, related to their chemotherapy. If you look, 20% uh, of the men had either high, very high, or severe uh, side effects, and this would be things like neuropathy, erectile dysfunction, thyroid dysfunction. Um, if, you, if you combine medium, though, 
that's half. Half either had medium to severe symptomatology. Uh, and some of the studies have really picked up uh, side effects that we wouldn't have expected otherwise, like hearing loss or tinnitus. Uh, that's a 16-fold increase in that for men who've undergone uh, chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is required and certainly saved many lives, but it, it comes at a cost. In conclusion, there are several treatment options available for men with stage one testicular cancer. Weighing out the risks and benefits of surveillance versus surgery or chemotherapy is very important. And uh, kind of understanding the guidelines as a way that we can use a frame of reference could be helpful to urologists going forward. Thank you for your time.